Welcome to a very special Friday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. I had announced earlier this week that after Monday night's election results, we were taking the week off, but we want to dig deep into some of these results and talk about the election that we just went through as a city the last 10 months, the last uh, almost 12 months, depending on when some of the candidates actually announced, uh, resulted in a uh, election of a new council across the city of Calgary, but also uh, changes in mayoral races and councils across this province. Uh, as always, we are bringing in our guest with the most information who wants to come and talk with me because I love having people come and talk with me. The host of the Conservative Like Me podcast, our conservative uh, pundit, our world foreign affairs pundit, our politics pundit, Miss Jennifer Sanford. Jennifer, thank you so much once again for doing this. And I will start off by saying this before I let you even introduce yourself. Election, mayoral election, I think you owe me two stakes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm 0 for 2 if you guys have been listening. I, uh, yeah, I can't seem to get this right. Um, and yet I continue to think I have a valid opinion, but no, yes, I, I do owe Chris now two steak dinners. And so now I got to find something to be like an all or nothing steak extravaganza to try to reclaim myself. But you know what, if there's someone that I'd re- like to sit across from and have dinner with, it's, uh, it's always Chris Brown. That's true. Um, we are, when we're recording this, we're the day after the election, First initial thoughts on the election results here in the city of Calgary. We have a new mayor. We have uh, an almost relatively new council with some returning faces and some new faces. What were your initial thoughts? Well, obviously, I'm going to see it through the lens of conservatism because I am a conservative. I think that today feels a little nerve wracking. Um, You know, we've just had a federal election Um, And we really steadily chose a a liberal government and a liberal mandate um, and saw the strength of the NDP. We've got provincially uh, a a provincial government that I think has really lost its footing on the conservative values of fiscal responsibility. Basically, that's a really nice way of me saying, I don't know what I don't know what they're doing. Uh, We've got, I guess, a provincial government that that does live under the conservative banner, but is completely stalled uh, to take active action to make a conservative um, experience, you know, saliable to Albertans. And then now, you know, at the municipal level, and a lot of people feel that all good governance is municipal governance, we have a very, very progressive uh, mayor and a very progressive city council. So the rails are off. We're a little bit off the rails for conservatives. Um, I think those people who are worried about, you know, affordability, uh, worry about the the stress that we're going to put on our tax dollars and the availability of tax dollars, you know, I think we're worried. I think we're worried. And I think that that story has been under underrepresented and and not told enough in the last year. I, we, we talked about this briefly on our federal election night results show. I, I asked you the question, has, has Canada become an urban versus rural divide? Even in Edmonton, we saw a liberal, former liberal minister of natural resources win the uh, Edmonton mayoral's uh, seat in uh here in the uh, city of Calgary, we have a woman leader who, for the words that we are saying right now, is a progressive. But if you look at her track record and her voting record, you may not completely agree with that statement. But she identified as a progressive during this race. She had progressive support. And we are now in a progressive uh, city, as you've just said. Has urban Alberta turned its back on conservatism within our electoral process because we have four seats now in urban Alberta that are not conservative. Yeah. I mean, I think that we have to challenge what we're comparing the two things to. I think there's conservatism, conservatism, and then there's uh, like liberal. I think liberal is the word. I hate the progressive being the word because I'm a conservative and I consider myself to be very progressive. I care genuinely about the environment and climate change. Um, you know, I, I believe in having adequate support programs that that lift people out of poverty in a really measurable way. I mean, I I consider myself to be progressive. I'm a champion for the LGBTQS plus QIA 
I got them all. I know I have them all plus community. Um, you know, I'm, I really believe that we need to, to make the, the white goose goose flying report here in Calgary, a saleable document. I hate that it's becoming what I call a Bob, which is a binder on a bookshelf. I think we need to make that actionable. I have a lot of progressive ideas. So to say that the two choices are being conservative and being progressive, I think is not fair. I think there's being conservative, which is really about fiscal constraint, limited government, all those things that they were once at one time. Then on the other side, you have liberal, which is we're liberal with how we collect money. We're liberal with how we spend money and we're liberal with how we report on what we're doing with transparency with people's money. I think we have reached a point where we as a, as a country and as a city and as a province are progressive. I think that's what one of the things we can agree on is we are all progressive. A lot of the things that we're trying to you know, to, to evolve into as a society are progressive. And I think you've got progressives on both sides. What you have is a difference of opinion on how we value taxpayers, a difference of opinion in how we spend money and a difference of opinion in how we measure the impact of our money. Conservatives believe it's paramount. Liberals don't care. What happened then? What happened on Monday night? Jeremy Farkas was poised to take over as the next mayor of our city, the 32nd mayor of our city, but he, he did not track with people. Uh, I think you're right. I think the progressives, I think we are all progressives in one way or the other. It's just how you identify what a progressive is, is completely to the person who is determining what they want as a progressive. So what happened? Because Jeremy Farkas was the conservative choice he had some great ideas, but he did not track. And t- we woke up Tuesday morning with Jody Gondek. Yes, of quite a quickly. Fourth, fourth I, I term on Mayor Nenshi. I yeah yeah yes yeah. Welcome to another term of, of Mayor Nenshi, only with um, with more PAC money uh, behind her. So I think what we have to we have to really look at is that I think Jeremy Farkas fell into, you know, a, a, a trope that's very easy for conservatives to fall into, which is that it becomes less about the mechanism that, that they will make decisions and more about the person. Jeremy Farkas was a difficult character to like, even for conservatives. I mean, even for myself, um, I, I was very active on the campaign trail to say, you know, if you're if you're voting for J- for Jody Gondek, you get to jump up and down and be like, Jody, Jody, I'm going full Gondek. It was like this big pride point. But Farkas voters were like, yeah, I'm voting for, are we all voting for Jeremy? Like we, it had just, it was this, this whisper campaign around like, okay, I, I don't want to self it. It reminded me a lot of what we saw in 2016, which is the jump up and down in the United States for Hillary Clinton as the president. And then people who were like, oh, like in polling, oh no, I, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. That guy's crazy. And then, you know, the cameras turned off and they're like, oh, we're all voting for Trump. We are all so excited. You know, they have to self-identify in a closet that they support a conservative candidate because they're, you know, they're worried about the, about the, you know, the, the ramifications, the ram, not the ramifications, but what it says about your own brand to, to put a vote in that direction. So I think a lot of that kept people from the polls and from investing in Farkas, but there is a big difference between the things that he stands for. So the leadership on ideas, and then the way in which he manifests language and decision-making and attitudes about the choices that he makes. So you have this thing where you have the veneer of leadership, and this so often happens to conservatives and more so to conservative men, which is going to lead me to my next point, which is that there's the, there's the decision that they make, which can, can be something that people can really get behind. But then there's the wrapper that they put it in, which is absolute madness. It's hate, it's anger, and it's a failure to surface community values to explain the point and to say, this is why you should come along. And as you know, I I think I've talked about this every time I've been on the podcast, municipal government is all about adaptive leadership. How can you surface community values, rally people around those shared values, apply your policy position on top of those values, and then bring people along to support you? And and liberal candidates do this very well because there's, you know, they just, they know it's all about, you know, how you build this triumph of, of, of ideas. But for conservatives, because so often our message is wrapped in no, it just becomes the no and the justification is never really fulsome. It's never really fulsome and it's never really offered with, with emphasis to the voter. So then the voter goes to the polls and they're, what are they faced with? 
Well, they're faced with the narratives that liberal candidates use with such great efficacy, which is we will move you forward, they will move you backward. Your vote is going to take the city backward at a time when people are terrified around the transition that the city needs to undertake. So that's the first issue. The other, the other challenge of this is, is that I don't believe Farkas was robust enough to actually say, amid all of these things that we cannot do, these are the things that we can do. And I think that, that that transition came too late in the campaign. And I think that it didn't, it didn't, it didn't reach its salience enough in the public debates that were held. When I was going to school back in oh, wow, early 2000s, I feel old. I feel old, old, old. But when I was in university and college, I was often told that politics at a municipal level come down to one thing. Who do I want to have a beer with? Who can I oh. see? in my, the backyard having a beer with. I think a lot more people looked at Jody Gondek and saw the open welcomeness and like uh, accepting person that she might be portraying. And when they looked at Jeremy Farkas, they looked at someone who didn't know how to properly cross his arms when he's standing for a photo. I don't know how- okay, that is a thing. That is a thing. Why was that such a thing? Like, I think it's actually- what is this? <laughs> What is this? Like, oh I God. was like, what for those of you listening, Chris looks not okay. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I think do. what you're, I think if we, if we turn that on its head a little bit differently, I think it's actually more complicated than that. I think it's actually the rise of, I don't want to have another problem. People are taking very personally the stress that the provincial government is putting on people. You, you see it on social media, you hear about people talking about it in coffee shops and with their families. They're saying like, I'm not sure if I need mental health support so much to deal with the pandemic anymore. I'm learning to sanitize and wear a mask and get vaccinated, but I am feeling like I need mental health, health supports because this government has managed this crisis too so poorly. And I think that because people have said, I, I, it's not so much, do I like this person? It's, do I really want to wake up in the morning and check my Twitter feed and talk to my friends and family and think I, I now have another problem. This person is a stressor to my life because I, I, I don't know if they're going to lead us in a direction that I can support. And I take that very personally as a human person. So I think that was a little bit of, of the Farkas thing. And it really does come back to a vision for the city as if he was able to say like, listen, my leadership isn't just about no, although there is a lot of that. We have some crazy no here, 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 and here, but there's also things that we are absolutely going to do. And here's how we're going to do them. And then also making a case to say, I know you have like post-traumatic stress disorder about the UCP government, someone who can work with that government, no matter how difficult that may be, might actually be in our best interest as, of, as a city. Right, this constant strife between Nenshi and Kenny hasn't helped anybody. It hasn't helped the province to do what it needs to do, and it has not helped this city. And it's created a whole host of problems and oversight around what is the true role of municipal government, because there had to be a lot of overreach because that relationship is so broken. And you even just saw Nenshi taking that, you know, that final kick at the cat, you know, hold no punches. You know, that's that's so beneath him. Uh, as a as a mayor, and it's so beneath that office, it's 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 unfortunate. But I think what you have to what you have to look at the veneer of that is that Farkas could have said, "What would be the benefit here of us taking the municipal needs that we have as a city of Calgary and going to the province and saying we may be we may be very different, we may be very similar, but we absolutely have to work together because people are stressed and they're worried about what their experience is as an Albertan and as a Calgarian." Would it you doesn't mean we're in cahoots with one another. It just means we got to work together. Would you say the same thing to Jason Kenney about Justin Trudeau? Because uh -huh. as a conservative, you got to, because you, you're talking from a progressive, a, a quote unquote liberal to a conservative premier, a liberal mayor, Nahe Nenshi, while he identifies as an independent, I'm pretty sure we all know that, that he is not a, true. Exactly. Um, would you say that to Jason Kenney and say, suck it up, buttercup, it's time to put on your big boy pants and actually sit down with Justin Trudeau and have an actual conversation? And I would say the same thing to Justin Trudeau. Time to put on your big boy pants and actually sit down with the premiers and have a conversation and stop trying to dick around and try to freaking do this all by yourself. 
you know, I, a little I, out of ta- out of uh, whack here, but I got to ask that question, then we'll move on. It's it's a it's a val- it's a valuable question to ask. I think it, it absolutely it always deserves to be said when you have um, two levels of government, especially when they're differing political affiliations, to say we absolutely have to work together. Now, two things that hamper that from being a bit different from the municipal to provincial is the fact that there are systemic challenges based on confederation that have have made Alberta the workhorse of Canada and not a seat at the table. So there's systemic challenges there that do not exist from a city of Calgary to a a provincial. So it's a bit different in that regard. But also, uh, there is a lot that Jason Kenney can be doing that he doesn't need the 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 federal government's buy-in for, right? You know, I've talked about this on the podcast before, you know, if the minute that the carbon tax was made um, a a permanent piece from the the Supreme Court Court. legislation, Kenny could have exercised the notwithstanding clause and moved us into cap and trade, the same thing that Quebec has immediately. So there are lots of things he can be doing to demonstrate leadership before he has to get Justin Trudeau involved. So there, there, it's a bit like it, comparing apples to airplanes, but overall, I'm always a big believer that you have to say that these levels of government have to work together with greater efficiency. I mean, for Nenshi to say, like, I haven't even met with Kenny since the summer. Well, what would be Kenny's incentive to work with you? You have a relationship, a working relationship with Justin Trudeau. You've cut him completely out of the system and demonstrated to tremendous municipal oversight in some of the decisions that you've made in the last year. So you know, that relationship is really destroyed. And I wish that Farkas could have got on message with that a little bit better to say, Hey, listen, I know that I have a reputation as being difficult to deal with. I know I have a reputation as an, uh, of a, as a no man, but I also have a, I also have this understanding that one of the most paramount jo- roles of my job or is, is going to be to take that firmness that I have, but say, here are the, here are the rights of, of Calgarians. And I'm bringing that to, to the, to the provincial government. And we've got, we've got to work better together in service for Calgarians, because it comes back to that classic line. We saw every candidate spewing. There are three levels of government that all want your tax dollars. And there's one taxpayer. I also want to make sure that I mention this. To the provincial government uh, cabinet, to provincial cabinet, to the provincial MLAs, um, don't take the bait when politicians send out letters like that. It makes you look uh, weak, petty, and insecure about your own uh, future. When Casey Madu came out and attacked Menchie about that, I, I rolled my eyes because at the same time, you do not live in the city. And you should be worrying about what's happening provincially. You are the attorney general of this province and let Nenshi ride off into oblivion with his guns a-blazing and just ignore him. And that could have been a better PR stunt for you. Yeah, absolutely. Drop the rope. Yeah, Drop the rope. (laughs) Let's get back to the uh, election on Monday. we were on the cusp of uh, breaking the glass ceiling for two different uh, methods. So one woman being elected into the highest power, highest seat in Calgary, but also a member of the LGBTQ community if uh, Jeremy Farkas had won on Monday. During this campaign, the Jody Gondek uh, campaign made it known that she was a woman. I'm pretty sure if you looked at her, you would know that she was a woman, but they wanted to make sure that people knew that she was a woman because in 137 years of our city, we have never elected a woman until Monday night. Uh, I had two guests on during the uh, broadcast last uh, on Monday night, and they talked about how it was good for women to be represented at the seat. From a conservative perspective, uh, what was your initial thought of having a woman finally as the leader of our city? Pass. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, people are going to get my home address. Uh, okay, so as a woman, um, I will offer my own view, which I know is shared with probably other women, but maybe not the masses. And that is that I do think it's, I think, I do think it's good that our mayor um, be a man or a woman, and we are not unafraid to, to, you know, to, to choose the candidate that we want and that we have, you know, a good representation of what our city looks like on city council. I think that's a good thing, but I don't think that that should be the reason. 
I think that Jody Gondak should be chosen because you like her policies, because you like the way that she's going to bring this community together, because you see her vision and you see yourself in that and you feel proud that that's the direction that our city will go. Not because you're like, this is the gender that I'm picking. You know, I'll just speak from my own experience. You know, I really, for a long time, wanted to work for NASA and I wanted to be an astronaut and as a little person. And I had a lot of people in my life who were like, oh, that's a job for boys. That's a, that's a boy job. Um, you know, you could probably, you know, help in some way, but you're probably not gonna, that's probably not a goal that can be achieved. And, you know, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> All women should believe that they should belong in all spaces where decisions are being made. That's of course not my, not my words, words of someone greater than me. And it's always great to see women succeeding, but the reasons why they should succeed should not be based on what they look like. We are too evolved as a city and as a society for identity politics. I dismiss entirely the idea that we need to have one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these, and then we have what should represent us. I think we should have the absolute most qualified people and all of those people on the ballot should look like our city. I, I feel like we should invest in, in programs that allow you know, greater diversity into some of the areas where we need diversity, like conservation and in, in, in environmental um, uh, protections and, and, and climate change advocacy. You know, I think I, I want, I want a greater representation of voices, but I don't want those voices to be because we're trying to make this makeup. You see me explaining this point several times over because every time I try to articulate this, there's a women do what women do, which is try to just cut each other all apart, uh, until there's, until there's only one person that can speak for all women. I, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt you and ask you a question. Would you be saying this if Jody Gondek was a conservative? No, no, no. Although I will, this was a point I was going to make earlier, but I'll make it now. Chris, and I'm asking this genuinely, where are all the conservative women? Where are the conservative women? I mean, there's me, you found me, I'm right here. Where are the other, <laughs> he's pointing at me, where are the others? I am often frustrated with where like, you know, we, we want, we want women to assume these places of power, but then they're, they're all very, very, very liberal. Where are the conservative women? And maybe just maybe it will be a conservative woman that will help to rebrand what it means to be conservative in 2021 and beyond. I'm, I'm willing to wonder, because if we have to play these games around identity politics, then maybe it's going to take a conservative woman to say, well, maybe it's my turn to explain what we mean by fiscal responsibility, by responsible budgeting, by ensuring that taxpayer dollars are used with maximum efficiency, that we respect you as a taxpayer. Like, maybe this is now the job for a conservative woman to do. I don't know. All I know is that I have worked so hard to use the opportunities that I have responsibly. I went to Ivy League schools. I had chances to be educated and travel and do all of those things. If I am picked for my next position because I am a woman, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to freak out. I don't want to be picked because I'm like, oh, this will be good for our diversity numbers and this will be good for representation and this will be good you know, because we haven't had a woman in this role in a long time. I'd be like, hard pass. I don't want it. I don't want it. I want it because you've looked at the entire candidate pool and you've said, Jen's going to be the one to get this done. And I know that there has to be a part of Mayor Gondek this morning who feels the same. Like, gee, I hope I was picked, not because it was time for a female mayor, but because I am the most qualified woman for the job. And I also just happen to be a woman. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll move it down to the ward races for, for good purpose here. Jasmine Mayan is now the counselor for ward three, right? Jody's old haunt. And that woman is a sharp policy mind. The way she thinks about policy is exactly the way municipal leaders should think about policy. The way she is pragmatic about what's possible, the way she thinks about the technical correctness of a policy, like will it actually achieve the outcome? She was the candidate for that role. The fact that she happened to be a woman is so secondary to those incredible accomplishments of how her mind will serve this city in Ward 3 and beyond. 
And I think that that's what we're aspiring for. Like, it's just like, we picked these 14 counselors and mayor and they're the best we could find. And look at this. They also look like our city. I just think it's what comes first and what comes second. So that's my take on it. my very, I think, unpopular take on it. No, but I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think I, on the show, I've said numerous times over and over again, vote for the person that best represents your values, your morals and the policies, because you, you, you are making this. <laughs> now I'm about to go on a rant here, Jen. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> For those who did not vote on Monday, I, I have one thing to say to you, shame. Why not? We have one tool, one tool to hold politicians accountable, and that is our vote. If you woke up Tuesday morning thinking, oh, no, this person got in and I didn't want them and you didn't vote, don't want to hear from you ever again. Especially if you live in Ward 9 and Ward 4, where every vote absolutely did matter. Yeah which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, but we will, we will talk about Ward 4 in a few minutes after we get done with this identity politics. It's not only women that use the identity politics. No. It's the, we need people to represent us. We need people who look like us to represent us. And I think there was a blind, uh, blind, uh, horse blinders on for a lot of voters who said, I like this person because he looks like me or she looks like me. And understandable, if that's the reason you want to vote for somebody, go right ahead. But do not tell me that I have to vote for you, that person, because of that. And that is the thing that I've been pissed off the most about during this election. I have seen from all parts of this city, not just uh, places of large, diverse candidates, that they have said to me, you need to vote for this person because they will represent us because they look like us. No, I'm going to vote for at the end of the day. I've, I'm not going to tell you who I voted for, but I can tell you I voted for people who I believe had the best policies at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's how we should be electing people municipally, yeah. provincially, even federally, and the godforsaken pointless election of a senator. Yeah, whatever that was. I have to I have to give a shout out to Ward Ward 6, which I cared more about than I should have given the fact I don't live in that ward. But there was a candidate who who tried to best Richard Putman's um Lana Bentley. Lana Bentley is the untold story of this entire election. Her vision of disciplined community engagement, disciplined environmental action was so liberal and so progressive, but was wrapped in this veneer of practicality that really made a tremendous um, appeal to conservative voters like me. And that is a, is a striking example of what I think the future potential of this city is. She was not successful last night, but if any candidate that, or any campaign that was successful last night, her phone must be ringing. She she deserves to be in City Hall in a position of power by the sheer fact of the way she thinks about preventative interventions versus crisis interventions, the way she thinks about climate action. I, I could just go on and on and on and on about her. She also happens to be, you know, a woman and a, and a person of color. She never campaigned on that. She campaigned on the idea of ye with the best ideas gets to go to city hall. Yeah. And I think that I find that to me tremendously em emblematic of, of, of the, the types of campaigns that I hope that we run in the future. Look at you talking about liberals or progressives that aren't conservative. You, I, I've melted <laughs> your conservative heart on this show. It's taken a, a few months. No, I, I liked, I liked Lana from the first time I heard her speak. I was uh, moderating a conversation among candidates and I didn't know a lot about her and she showed up. And within the first two questions, I thought 
there's something magnificent here. And I think that she had that great quality of bringing not only um, a, a, an ideas driven leader, but someone who was going to figure out that as we transition, we cannot leave people behind. And I think that she would have been a tremendous asset to, to Ward 6, but I'm sure her phone must be ringing today. I think we'll see her in City Hall in some capacity. I sure hope we do. We would be lucky to have someone like Lana and not because of what she is and who she, what she looks like, but because of the way in which her mind will serve this city. Uh, I want to just take a moment right now and talk about some of the other writings that, uh, and I know identity <laughs> politics is not, not, not writings, but in other municipalities across the province that elected women last night. And there was a lot. There was some women who defeated incumbent mayors and they are hard to, it, it is often harder incumbent to counselors. defeat an incumbent in municipal uh, uh, elections than it is federally or provincially. Yes, but it is. We woke up Tuesday morning with just just under half of the population of Alberta being represented by women as mayors in our province. Drumheller, Olds, Innisfail, uh, Okotoks, Medicine Hat. Medicine Hat flipped, and there was a long-term incumbent mayor there who ran for re-election and lost spectacularly. Banff is back in the women's col column for... Uh, their mayor, because Karen Sorensen, left to go be a senator. Yes. Incumbent is now a female. Women. Is a woman. We're not allowed to say female. Sorry, woman. Didn't you? We are. We are now in a more woman friendly politics arena where women have the ability to get elected. Or is that your takeaway? Or am I just the man with privilege here talking about that? Well, I, I think we're, I think the, the thing is, is that we're seeing more women on the ballot, right? We're seeing more women on the ballot and saying like, my gender doesn't preclude me from participating in this area of work. And that's an, that's a great thing. That's what we aspire to. That's what equality is, right? Is people saying, oh, I can, I can be part of this. I can be part of this. I remember when I was, this makes it sound like I, I I'm 38 now, but it makes it sound like I went to the school, to school in the forties. But I remember when I was in grade six and I wanted to run for student council and I went to go see the principal and said, I'd like to run for student council. I appreciate that I'm in the youngest grade in the school, but I think I'm really disciplined. And he was like, absolutely. You, you would be a great secretary. Like, why didn't that principal tell me I could have been the president or vice president or finance or like, why was I just like, oh, you will probably a very good note taker. Turns out I was a terrible note taker and I only got one vote, but that doesn't matter. That's not the goal of that story. The goal of the story is that now you hope that all the way from neighbors and parents and high school guidance counselors and principals and people who are in places of influence are saying, yeah, of course, of course, you're going to be on a ballot one day, right? Be unafraid, be on the ballot. And then, you know, sending a message to the public, the public has said, yeah, of course you should be here. Of course you're here. You have great ideas. Of course you're here. So, you know, that's, I, if that's I, what just, the aspiration is. That's great. I'm, I'm just happy that more women are in that leadership role and maybe we can get away from the idea that we have to continuously keep on asking women to run because they should be able to run if they want to or not and so should men if you want to run go run you shouldn't have to be begged and kick, kicking and screaming to the poll or to the uh, nomination location so i i just hope that now that we are in a world where we see more women elected we can keep our gas uh, foot on the gas pedal but not assume that we need to have organizations where we have to ask people to run because we shouldn't have to ask. We should just assume that people are going to run. That's my last statement on that statement. Do you have anything left before we talk about third-party advertising? And Yeah, you know, I have... <laughs> I have my own thoughts on the Calgary based organization, ask her and their program, prepare her. I was a, I was a, I don't know, participant if that's what I say. And I, I have some thoughts around what that organization really truly wants to aspire to be. Yeah, they need some genuine reform. And I think that they'll go through that period of reform. Now, I think they have to ask themselves, what is the true goal of how they want to serve candidates that go through that training school? And uh, I wish them best of luck as they audit that and ask themselves some really tough questions. So I'll just leave it there because I really want to talk about PACs and Let's third party advertisers. PACs and third party advertising. Uh, this is the first election uh, under the new Municipal Government Act where businesses and unions could not donate to municipal candidates. 
and third parties had to register with elections, Alberta and elections, Calgary, or so so on and so forth. We saw both sides, uh, the right and the left, come out with third party advertising into political action committees. Uh, it wasn't a big issue until probably September when the election really started kicking off and people went, oh, wait, all these third party advertisers and political action committees have money and they're spending them on elections. Before we talk about the winners and the losers of the third party advertising, the political action committees, what's your opinions on them? Because I'm not in favor of them. I think they should not be allowed. I think they should be disregarded and the provincial government needs to overturn that part of the section and say, nope, no third party advertising for anyone. So it all comes down to what type of campaigning you want to see. And you have two choices. Door number one, you can have great grassroots campaigns where people give to campaigns and they publish their donors, which I think should be a mandatory requirement of any campaign for the real time posting of donors. And you run your campaign based on ideas, you door knock, you fundraise for signs, you have little community events, you know, sell a muffin for $4. And it's just this quaint little way of this city of a million people deciding who they want to lead it. That's door number one. Door number two, you can have PACs and third-party advertisers try to prop up candidates, uh, you know, uh, have misinformation campaigns, frustrate voters, confuse voters, and fight in the jungle. And that's what this campaign really was. This was gross for Calgary. And I don't know why this wasn't a topic of conversation every day by the news media. And we're going to talk about the news media because I know you, Chris, but I, this was gross. This was gross, the amount of money that got into this campaign, the brand confusion between when you couldn't decipher an ad from a third party advertiser and an ad from the candidate, the amount of PAC money that made, you know, candidates, these larger than life, untouchable, you know, forces to, 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 to run for office. This is not what this city is. This is not what the city is. I've, I've, I've seen how this has ruined American elections. And you talk about, is there an urban and rural divide? There is an America and there will be here if we continue to have this. Um, there's no reason why we need this at a municipal level. There is no reason why we need this. It's an unnecessary David and Goliath proposition that you put forward for voters. And it's, we don't need it. We don't need it. We, we shouldn't want it. We should... It's, I loved the campaigns that, that fundamentally believed that elections are won at the doors, talking to voters, saying, this is what I have to offer, bringing them to small community events, not this massive infrastructure of whatever the hell some of these candidates have. And you're absolutely right that you had packs on both sides. And then what did we start talking about when we needed to be talking about real ideas? We were talking about where are the packs, who owns what to who, who's transparent, who's donating, who's, to, in, who's donating to who, who is it? And it never became about the political issues. And so what got to happen, which makes me super sick in this campaign, is that then candidates could say super reckless things and nobody was checking it because we were so busy trying to figure out where did that message come from? Who endorsed that message? Who's giving her that kind of policy guidance? Who's you know building this collateral on her behalf, his or her behalf? And that's and then in the meantime, you had the totally reckless rhetoric of, camp of candidates in both the mayoral race and especially in the ward races. This, um, in Ward 10, I did not see that much social media backing of the two packs that I, I forget their names right now, Look Forward Calgary or Forward Calgary and Calgary's Future, or whatever it's called. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm active on social media, but I didn't see it. I did see it for other campaigns, though, some that were in closer races than maybe 10, because I think 10 was going to be Andre Chabot, no matter what happened, because yeah, Andre Chabot was... was the name recognized. And in a time where people were leaving council in the exodius that was, 10 out of the 15 were not running for re-election or running for a different position. Uh People of Ward 10 and Ward 6 were looking and saying, hey, Richard Proopman, I know that guy. Andre Chabot, I know that guy. So I'm going to vote for that guy again because I know them. So 
I didn't see it as much. I know that people tried to make hay out of it and people were talking about it. I know there's two news organizations, independent news organizations, one news independent news organization that did an article on it. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, I read it and I, I hate PACs. I will be the first to admit, I don't think they should be around. I don't even think they should be around provincially or federally. At the end of the day, the person with the best idea should win. And we need to get back to the uh, the door elections, the people at the door. And I know in 2021, it's hard to do that due to COVID-19. Oh, stop it. Everybody door knocked. Everybody door knocked. You could do it socially distanced. I know. Everybody I know, did it. But not having those community events, not being able to go to every event, not being able to meet one-on-one -on -one with people it's it was hard and i know social uh zoom meetings and facebook lives were a big people thing. don't want them but the people don't no. want them you can schedule them people don't want them so i i just think third-party advertisings need to go away community packs need to go away if that's the case next election i think we need to start the jc political action committee where we endorse everyone and just screw everyone up and just say hey we're going to endorse every candidate that's running why because we can and you can't tell us we can't because that's how stupid they are and I half the time half the time i apologize i heard reports from numerous candidates from across this riding that the packs weren't even approaching people other than the new, the ones that they knew they were going to endorse Yes. Wasn't that an important story, right? Some candidates didn't even have an opportunity to, to present their, their endorsement. Obviously there was that huge windfall with Evan Woolley's endorsement in ward eight, which got pretty cantankerous or, and, and pretty difficult for a lot of people who tried to express a voice of opposition to how that endorsement went. But I think where we're looking at is who are the voices of influence and there are some endorsements that I think matter. I think community association endorsements matter, right? A community association who's working on the ground for these communities to be able to say, we've looked at all the candidates and you know, we as a board really believe that this is gonna serve our community the best. And here's why, here's some of the projects we've brought to him, her, they, and, and, and they've, they've indicated some, like I think community associations have a voice in this. Their voices were not heard. Uh, because we've got these big machine packs. Um, I just, yeah, I do think that there are voices of influence. I just don't think that they're where the money is. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, community associations, while we're on that topic, we're scared this election to come out because there was a lot of races that no one knew what was going to happen. I think until probably the last week of the campaign where we started saying, okay, this person might win, this person might win, people started actually paying attention. And if you look at the results and if you look at the numbers, more people voted in advanced voting than they did on election day. That's right. And I think the other piece of this is, is that we were guided by incredibly shitty polling. We had very little polling and the polling that was done was biased and had well, your unofficial poll doesn't count, Chris. My unscientifically totally real poll that was done by totally 900 people actually was done by over a thousand people, but we had to get rid of some because they don't know how to fill out a survey properly. <laughs> And that would be what I'm talking about. That would, and I even found this door knocking, like in uh, in Ward Eight. I did some fun door knocking with a candidate there, and the amount of people who were like, "Oh, I'm just going to vote for Evan again," and you're like, "Okay, he's not, he's, he's not, not running." Um, and it's so hard to deliver that news at the door in a way that sounds encouraging when you're really like, "What? What?" He's not um, but this person, <laughs> but this person is. Um, and then there's, well, is this person like that person? Uh, nope. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. What am I trying to say here? It's, I just we're, think we're guided think, by such shitty polling. We were, um, I think common sense put out a poll, uh, a few days after the advanced voting, uh, we did a lot of, and it was not accurate. Exactly. And that was that was the joke that I was trying to get behind because they put out a poll and like, hey, look, at, and I even copied their colors because it was so ridiculous. We're not putting out poll number five and nine because the, our, it's in within the margin of error. What? <laughs> what yeah, I don't. About? Yeah. Candidates really got nervous about that poll. And I was it, it was it was hard to sort of look at that and say, well, this is feels like a statistically accurate thing. But one of the things it did reveal that ultimately did manifest on election day, and I think this is a point worth bringing up, is that it did talk about 
how dangerous a wide pool of candidates was going to be in this election. And that's a big talking point here today that we really need to step back as citizens and as people who aspire to run to elect for elected office need to step back and look at. And I think we do need some reform here. This is my pitch to it. When you have eight or nine or 12 candidates on a ballot for a riding, you inherently give a tremendous gift to the incumbent. And didn't that manifest itself as the story of Ward 9, right? Kara has been facing an uphill deal because of the fact that it seems like he serves a small interest of the ward. And I think it's no secret that I'm not a fan of Kara. We've had more than one run in and he's just not my, he's just, I just don't think he's the guy for the ward. And Ward 9, to be clear, is my ward. So if you think about the fact that there's 88, this is, this is, a, this is your favorite part of the podcast, Chris, where Jen does election math. There's 88,000 people that live in Ward 9. If we remove out the people that are not eligible to vote, which is about 20 to 21% of them, that gives us 69,000 people that can vote, eligible voters. So if you consider that 19,500 and 752 did vote 28 percent of ward nine voted in this election which is terrible that's terrible of those 63 percent voted for somebody else and the reason why that matters is because that means that this guy goes back to city hall with two-thirds of his ward saying i didn't want you I did not want you. And, you know, he as an incumbent, you know, I don't think he's going to take the time to step back and say, okay, well then what were the, what were the political ideas that had salience? It was just like, I won and the will of the voters didn't and suck it. And I think people like Damon Kahn and, and, and John William Wade owe an apology to Naomi Withers this morning because she came within a couple hundred votes. What, what is it? 200 votes of defeating him. Thank you. And if they had been out of it, that those votes, I believe would have gone over to her. And I think that that is so disparaging to what our goal is. Why is it that these candidates couldn't have got together as a group and said, what is our goal? Is our goal to defeat the incumbent or is our goal to see if I can win? People have an inherent understanding of how far they are from the capability to pull off a win. And if you're not there by the withdrawal date, which I do think should be far closer to election day than it is. And I appreciate that it's not because they have to do things like print ballots and stuff, but I think technology can help us here. I do think that they have a responsibility to get out of the way for the candidate that has the best chance of defeating the incumbent if we all accept that that is the will of the ward. And it frustrates me to see that that didn't occur. And I think that there should be a tremendous shout out this morning to people like in in Ward 8, people like Ted Knudsen. He got out of it. He had a good chance early on, but then he got out of it because he thought, I'm not I'm not helping here. And, and if we want to defeat the incumbent, or if we want to have a particular type of voice to take on this riding, which Ward 8 had no incumbent, I have to get out of this thing. And we see the danger of what happens when you see 11 people on the ballot. It drives me crazy. The same even if we're talking about Ward 8. Courtney Walcott has won Ward 8. 69% of voters don't want him. So I'm, I'm, I, this, is, this is the part of the show where Chris and Jen disagree immensely. And this is the great thing about having you on because we can agree on a lot of things. This I do not agree with you on. Naomi Withers did not lose that election because of John William Wade or Derek Reimer or Laurie Massey or Damon Kahn. They didn't. Laurie, Naomi Withers didn't get enough votes. Plain and simple. She did not. She had 28% of the people who she could have identified to bring to her camp. She didn't. And this is for every candidate out there right now. If you're saying this, if you're saying on Tuesday morning that every candidate who lost by 100 votes, like DJ Kelly or uh, or name it Withers, they're waking up on Tuesday morning and thinking, ah, oh, if only this person would have dropped out, I would have won. No, if you would have worked a little bit harder, if you would have identified more votes, it comes down to that. 
Yeah, I, no, I, listen, but that's I'm our not, system. I'm that's our system that we that's our system that we live in as well. We live in a system where the first past the post, one vote matters. Yes, I, we, listen, I'm not I'm not discounting that there that the GOTV, the get out the vote portion of this isn't exactly the most important point of failure for every campaign. But you're telling candidates who are running that if you don't think you're gonna win, every candidate thinks they're gonna win and they want to no, win. No, they don't. No, they don't. That's yes, that's a fictitious retelling. There's right. lots of people that are like, I'm just in it. I don't know. They they don't have any money, they just don't, they don't have any good policy ideas. They're doing it as a vanity project. They're a great vanity candidates all in each ride in each writing but and i think doing they it have no i think at a certain point getting into the race go crazy go crazy get your signatures and get in there but then have a little bit of reality therapy if you don't think you can take it find a candidate with momentum that aligns to your values and get behind them and i'm not saying that should be the singular strategy I also believe you should be working very hard to get out the vote. The, get the, the voter representation, if we're just focusing on nine, it was dismal. So many people didn't vote at all. That's terrible. What are the barriers for them to feel like they belong in this election? That should be absolutely investigated. But I'm also saying when you look at a crazy ballot like that, you have a responsibility as a candidate to say, if someone else aligns to my vision and there's momentum, I have a responsibility to get behind the person with momentum. I think this, I think this is the first time you and I have actually openly disagreed upon something to the point because <laughs> I think at the end of the day, anyone who wants to run, go for it, go for it. Because I can tell you that if you want to run for any seat, any position, you have the right to do so. And you, if someone tells you, you need to drop out, which there were reports from mayoral candidates being told that I will pay you to drop out. There were reports of ward candidates being told to drop out in favor of mm -hmm. a candidate. And if yeah. that's the case, shame on those people who were asking those other candidates to drop out because you have no right. People have put their time and effort. And even if they got 15 votes on election day, if they got one vote, which let's be honest, some of the mayoral candidates probably came close to only getting one vote, but that's here nor there. They had the right to be there because they wanted to. I have But no you are discounting, you are discounting that people who are running in elections are thinking, breathing human beings. You're discounting their critical thinking skills. I agree with you that if you want to run, you should be able to run for sure. No, you're, absolutely. You're Get your name on the, the pallet. I'm also if, discounting that if you ask a person to leave, you should go to election jail. If you compensate a person to leave, you should absolutely face a, a, a consequence. But if you are a candidate in a race and you realize because you are evaluating what you're seeing at the doors, you're evaluating your race, which you're doing every day, and you see, oh my goodness, I think I'm hindering more than I'm helping then you get out the way. That's the point I'm making. And that's the point. I'm other making. point you're making is, so let we're sticking with nine because that's the one that was the closest for you because you are in that riding. Yes. You're saying if Damon Kahn, Derek Ryan or John William Wade left that, or they would Fezzer. all go to Na Naomi. I would no, no. Would, but if they like, like Fezzer was quite, was quite, um, was quite similar to Naomi. They were, they were quite similar ideologically. Um, if she knew in her early polling and she was seeing at the doors and she was looking at where her signs were and thinking, Oh boy, I do not have this. I do not have this. There should have been an opportunity for her to go to Naomi and say, I think if I tell my supporters to put their votes in your direction, that you can achieve a goal that we both share. I think you're you're thinking it's a kumbaya freaking world out there, and I think no no candidate who I've seen it I've seen it I've seen candidates I, I saw it in this election candidates there was another a gentleman who was running in nine and he showed up last night as a scrutineer for Naomi Withers he said yeah I was in it and I thought I could do it and then I met with her and realized she had more momentum and more potential and I thought I got to get out of here so that any vote that would go to me was going to go to her so I've seen it I've seen it I saw it in eight I saw it. In six, we've seen it. We've seen it. I, I will leave on this statement. If you want to run, run. Don't, Which I agree with. Don't let anyone tell you to get out of the race if you're. Which going, I also agree with. If you're going to split the vote and potentially have the incumbent win again, don't. That's all I've ever oh said. Oh my god! Because I okay. Well, you're you have a right to be wrong. And you, uh, what's the score right now? Two for two for Chris. Yes, this will be this will be where I redeem myself. This will be where I redeem myself.
Okay, so uh, let's last, let's talk about the last uh, big one here for a minute because I think you and I both agree on this statement. Where See, the, where, this is this is why we love this podcast, Chris, is because we always end on a great point of agreement where we just pile on to the point that we're trying to make, and then we just are like, "Well, thanks for listening, everybody." Yeah, exactly. Where was the news? Where was our news outlets in this election? Um, CBC, CTV, I, I, CBC and Global can't go wrong with them because they came and sat down with me and we chatted for a great time and it was a great interview and it got the show noticed and got my uh, story up there I've had people reach out Um, the news did a good job for me and I appreciate that but um, they did fall down a few other areas which were the ward races and in my interviews with CBC and Global I did state we never focus on the ward races we never focus on them because they are the hardest they no one seems to care about them they want to care about the mayoral chair because that's the person who is going to be leading our city but at the same time we have to remember in canada in our british democracy we have a very weak mayoral system within canada they are one vote one vote out of 15 in calgary so no matter who was in that chair this on tuesday morning they had to make sure they got seven other people uh, agreeing with them to get anything passed and anything done for the next four years. Um, I wish the, the mainstream media air quotes that would focus more on those down ballot races. Please do that next time. Like it, it tires me that we don't do that. And I jokingly said at the beginning of this interview that the guy fucking with cancer had to fucking hold debates for wards, forums for wards, because no other media was doing it. We lived, yeah, like, it's COVID-19 did not just come out of nowhere and we weren't we were surprised that we weren't going to be able to hold indoor forums anymore. Why, why did it come down to me? And I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. I hated the, the emails of negativity that I got. But at the same time, we need to do better. And as, a, in, as an independent journalist myself, we can do better. And I hope we do better for the next election. Because I, the people who reached out to me afterwards, after listening to those forums, said, I made my decision because I was able to watch this. I did half the races and I wish I was able to do all of them, but I got tired. I am exhausted half the time these days because of everything that's going on. And I wish I could have done more. And I feel like I've let people down for not being able to do more. And I wish the media would have picked up and done a little bit more to help me out. (laughs) Well, um, you did really let us down by not doing them all. And you should feel a tremendous amount of shame. Obviously that's the, that's the most paramount takeaway. Um, yeah, I, you know, independent journalism like you really did lead the charge because you recognize that while the mayor is the head of, of Calgary, the city council is the neck and the shoulders and they will turn that head in the direction that they so see fit. And it mattered to people. Um, it really did matter to people. People had a lot of confusion about what they knew and what they thought they knew. And I think that the media was absolutely derelict in its duty to really, um, do a few things. One, investigative journalism, and two, to finish the sentence. A running joke in my home was the amount of times that Jody Gondek said, you know, we send 40% of our taxation away to the province and I'm going to put an end to that. And that just was allowed to be said over and over again uh, with no follow-up. The follow-up to voters is, um, hi, sorry, quick question. If we hold that money back, doesn't that just mean that the federal, the provincial government is then just going to add taxation on top of that? Because we still have to pay for things like education. And I don't think that bill's going away. Did you, are you just saying right now that as you aspire to bring more money into the city to do pet projects for yourself, we're going to face ex- exceedingly higher taxation as Calgarians. That question was never asked by the news media. And that absolutely is like, this is why doctors have a Hippocratic oath because they have a moral responsibility to do right. And I don't know why journalists don't have the same in this, in this regard. They had a moral responsibility to say, let's actually just stay on that and finish the question. And I think that's where the, where this election as a whole came off the rails because people were able to say things or not say things. And there was nobody there for the checks and balances. 
And while I love this podcast, should it really fall to a man with cancer to be a checks and balances for how a city of a million people is led uh, and governed by an infrastructure of packed money now? So I, I, I feel tremendously bothered about this. And I think that what's going to happen now is there's going to be even more unchecked power. I mean, just not to pick on eight, but you know, we, we know that there was a citizen that came forward three days before the election who had done his own research to say, I I'm just realizing now that, that, that Courtney Walcott is behind a lot of this defund the police rhetoric, which, you know, was not successful in city council, but now that there's this new makeup of city council, potentially, you know, this could be a big issue. This is where he believes something that a lot of voters that are polled don't believe in, you know, can we have a conversation about Courtney Walcott's position on the police budget, right? Or, or the, or the makeup or the service delivery model or the funding of the police. And why was that up to a citizen to do that? Why was that up to a citizen to do that? Why wasn't that up to the, the journalistic infrastructure of this city? Independent, conglomerate, federally funded or otherwise. This is why we have trouble with this ridiculous rhetoric around defund the CBC is because people can use this as examples where it's not serving community interests. I, I appreciate, appreciate an independent medium. The issue is the big wigs in Toronto, Montreal, or wherever the main stations are, Toronto Star, Post Media, CBC, Global, Shaw, whatever you want to call them. They're going more national news and they're forgetting and they're taking money out of those federal or local stations. So you don't get, you have a, a newsroom that used to be 30 people when Ralph Klein was around, when Ralph Klein was mayor of the city. And now you have a newsroom of five and the five are supposed to do the work of 30 people. And it is a sad state of affairs when our media is attacked viciously with death threats, which I got my fair share during this election and that's here nor there and the police are- Oh, doing. it's both here and there. And we are- I, I hope that our media takes some time out of their day to look at what happened in the last 12 months when it came to provincial politics, because we are now a more divided city than we have ever been. And if you think the last four years were bad, wait to the next four years. They're going to get yes. worse and they're going to be more angry and more divisive than they have ever been. So I hope independent journalism survives and journalism starts holding people to account like they did when Ed, when Morrow was around, when Mansbridge was here. Like these are the, these are the people we should be striving to be and not trying to be the Ezra Levant's, the, hey, the gotcha journalism. And I hate That's that. Right. Journalism. That's right. That's right. And by that, you mean provincial and municipal. You said just provincial, but pro provincial and, and, and municipal. Federal. Yeah. And federal, of course, yeah, across the board. Um, I have to, I have to ask you this question, Chris, which I know I'm not the question asker, but I'm worried you're not going to get to it. Every time an election finishes, there's always this question about should we reform or introduce new policy or try to change elections of Alberta slash elections Calgary to 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 make changes to to you know the voting process, the voter qualification. Do you have anything on your list that you want to change? Because I. I made, I've been making a list as we've been talking you, and I have three, you, I have it three. It goes back to the disagreement that we just had. <laughs> okay. Municipally, we should change our voting uh, method. We should go to a ranked ballot. No way. Really? Yep. I agree wholeheartedly. Then what happens? Then you have those 11 candidates who are able to stay in because they might have a chance to win. And you have a ranked ballot where people will get knocked off until a person with 50% of the vote wins. You look at every single one of these writings, one. One of those people won with more than 50% of the vote last night. One person won with over 50% of the vote. How bad of a society are we that we have 14 people 
15 people, including the mayor, I should add that as well, who have been elected with less than 50% of the vote in their riding. We need to change that. That is where I would start. Day one, point one, change the system of how we elect our municipal public. And DJ Kelly, Ward 4 councillor, or uh, candidate because he was uh, Sean Chu did win, but there's a recount going on, and we yep. at the time of this being recorded, we don't know the results of that. Ward four councilor said that if he does not win, he will be advocating for that because we need people who are represented by fifty percent of the vote, and that would be the first thing. And I hope people take up that and start moving forward with that because we saw today or on Monday that voting is easy. The tabulation was easy. We had results by about 8.45. We knew who the next mayor was. That is unheard of. So we can do this. It's not that hard. So okay. that's where I would go. Where, what about mine, yourself? Mine are much more boring and procedural than that. Um, I'd like to see advanced voting move moved closer to the election. Yeah. I think that we had a real problem here where we had a, such a break between the end of advanced voting and election day, I think it made it hard on candidates because it's hard to door knock when you've got 141,000 people that have voted, right? You're out there, you're pounding the pavement, you're putting, try to put up signs. And the only thing you're hearing is I already voted, I already voted. And then you make that proposition to, to voters and they're like, oh, I wish that we would have talked earlier. And you're like, well, I tried to get out to your community. So I think advanced voting has to be much, much closer to the voting period. I think people who voted in two and four, uh, where there was some controversy about the about the candidates, I think that they're wishing that they would have had the opportunity to uh, have their advanced voting closer to voting day. Two? Yes? Well, Joe Maglianoka was- Well, large, he but... didn't win, and he, he lost I... by a large <laughs> lie by a large, but still, but still. No, I, I understand. Um, I understand, but um, the Sean Chu, like 52 votes, I guarantee you there's more than 52 people or there might not be. And here's the, let's talk about that for a second because we weren't going to, but I'm going to say this. Okay. This happened in the federal election. This exact incident. Yes, it happened did. In the federal election. And what happened? He won and he won by a small margin, just like Sean Chu. They did mm -hmm. a recount. He lost, he still won. And he's powering through and saying, I'm going to represent the people who have elected me as an independent in the House of Commons. For those people who think Sean Chu is going to resign, huh, I'm sorry, but unless he is found guilty, that is the only way he is going out of that uh, that chamber. Only way. Yeah, he he's yeah, he's not leaving. Let's be clear, he's not leaving. But you know, there's such a liberal, um, there's such a liberal group of people now on city council. You know that so much of his next few months will be the pressure for him to leave. What a terrible situation for the for ov obviously for the voters of 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 four and, and that, whole for that situation year old is so girl cool. that nineteen year old girl exactly and for I was just gonna say and for everybody involved there as 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 a victim of what happened there well, how terrible so the advanced voting piece um, the withdrawal date I think needs to be much closer to election day to allow as I've made my case candidates to get out so that they can put their support behind other candidates who can beat especially those that can beat incumbents. And I also believe that there should be a policy that in order to run an award, you must reside in the ward. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. I've said that from the beginning of this. I, I think if you represent a, even if you run provincially, federally, municipally, school, you have to live there. You need to live there. And the only reason I say that is because you have paper candidates that come in, that put their name on the ballot and walk away, or they look at the wards and say, hey, this, this ward's open or this riding's open. So I'm going to run as X candidate and I'm going to be able to win. And we saw that. And I think we should, and I think we should question any candidate that wants to represent a ward they don't want to live in. Like mm -hmm. for what reason? What is your real motivation there? And I, I just think that that's, an important question that we should be asking. It's bothered me for years. It's bothered me for years why that why you don't like and you should want to run where you where you live. You know the streets, you know the people, you know the construction challenges, you know the businesses. You you're just known to those to those people. So and I always do laugh because when it's a when it's a very liberal leaning candidate, people are like, oh who cares? He's a he, she, they are great people. Uh, and when it's a conservative, remember the flag that Jason Kenny took? Like he doesn't even live here. He doesn't even live in an Alberta. Um, it was. It's always such hay when it's a when it's a conservative leaning person. So, that, and then my last. Oh, go ahead. 
that we could do a week long series on the issues <laughs> of why the left thinks the right is wrong and why the right thinks the left mm-hmm. is wrong. Yes. Yes. Last- Over drinks. <laughs> Let's do it. And the last thing I will say is that the biggest takeaway that I'm taking away from myself is that, you know, the, the, the lane way, the runway for conservatives is really narrowing and it's narrowing, um, at every level of government. So the adaptation belongs to us. And what I want to see is the rise of a new narrative. And I would like to see more conservative women championing their way into that narrative. That's me. That's what I'm thinking about this morning. Actually, that's what I thought about all night, listening to the election results, pacing the hallway. What the last thing I will say is we are, how do I say this correctly? Our city is on the cusp of something that we are unknown and unsure about. Monday morning, our 15 new councillors, two of them being re-elected, are going to be sworn in for a term that is going to be heavily dominated by COVID-19. A lot of the candidates who have run have said, and I followed them on social media, Ward X has been left behind. Ward Y Mm -hmm. has been left behind. Ward 8 has been left behind. And we now have 15 people who are representing 15 wards and not 15 people representing our great city. My takeaway from that Monday night's election, when I saw the results come in, was we have 15 people representing 15 different uh, communities. We don't have 15 people representing the city of Calgary anymore. And that scares me. It scares me that we are going into a city, even even though the majority of people elected on Monday were under that Calgary forward or future Calgary or whatever you want to call it. We are now in a city where we are going to be more divided and we're going to be pitting wards against wards when it comes to infrastructure spending and not being look, not looking out for the bigger picture. And Jody Gondek has a big, big, big challenge ahead of her because she has 15 different, uh, 14 different voices on council now. You know what? I respectfully, I, I disagree totally respectfully. I really think that it, it is, it is time that there's greater representation of these individual ward differences Ward eight is so different from ward 11, which is so different from ward seven. We are a different city and we do pride ourselves on the collection of businesses and attitudes and diversity of people and diversity of thought within each of these. I think people really fighting for the individual interest of their wards as they shape what the city looks like is a very exciting proposition to me. I just hope we actually get something done then. (laughs) Ah, stuff will get done. And the greatest thing about it, it'll be we can afford none of it. (laughs) Amen to that. Unless Jody Gondek follows through and decides to have a referendum on equalization to the provincial government and ask for- Oh my God, stop it. Stop it. No, it'll just become very unaffordable. And then the people that will be leaving the city uh, won't just be young people. They'll be the tax people who pay a, a very high tax burden. So uh, and then you're in a real trouble. Before we do go, I want to talk about the referendums that happened on uh, Monday night because oh we, we, okay. I, well, I just, we got to ask the question because uh, daylight saving time, we still don't know. It's going to be coming out on the 26th of Monday, but in Alberta, in, in Calgary, in, uh, in Calgary, in Calgary daylight savings times was, hey, let's let's continue going back and forth. Uh, equalization, it was, hey, let's negotiate a new deal and fluoride. It was, hey, let's introduce fluoride. Were you shocked at any of the results or no? I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I mean, the, the equalization question proves how smart we are as a, as a city because we know that there is nothing we can do about equalization. And if you wonder why, uh, check, out my, check out my podcast um, uh, where we walk through equalization and why we can't change it in tremendous detail. Um, so I think people were smart. Like, I think the third option should have been pineapple. Yes, no, pineapple, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The daylight savings uh, question fascinates me for a couple of reasons, because I don't know why the question wasn't, should we 
change our clocks or remain on the same time year round. Because a lot of people voted and said, I'm voting no, because I want standard time. I want us to adopt and stay with standard time. And I feel like, first of all, whether we stay with standard or daylight is the job for experts, right? Because we got to look at it from an energy point of view, from a health point of view. We got to look at it from so many other angles than what voters are qualified to decide. But I think that that question was so silly that it was hard for people to to, to vote pragmatically on it. So that we, matters. We and had then a the joke. Issue with, sorry, we had a oh, joke about the daylight savings question because about five of us we were tra- chatting on via text and we were going, which way did you vote? Yes or no? And we didn't know if we voted for it or against it or against it or for it because it was so such a convoluted question that I think a, a lot of people went question. in going, what is the question? Like, am I voting yes to keep it or no to keep it? Like, how do I yeah. do it? <laughs> Why wasn't it just change clocks? <laughs> yeah. Question mark? Pineapple? Yes or no? Yeah, or yes, no pineapple. Like, I just don't understand why why it was like that. And then the last question about uh, fluoride, you know, I do think that those are close enough that they're going to have to punt it again. I think they're going to have to do a study or they're going to have to look at it from a cost perspective. I don't think this is like we were, we will have fluoride um, on Friday. No, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting that we're introducing it in the budget. Yeah, I think they're going to have to study it more from a cost perspective. I think there's enough people that didn't want it. If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I voted, I voted no. (laughs) I voted no. I know I, people were shocked that I voted no. And it's my whole thing about voting no was that I, I just, it's another expense. It's another expense. And I feel like if we don't have it in, we're less likely to have to talk about it again. But if we do have it in, there's going to be this entire infrastructure of, we need to get out. We need to get it out. Well, it will never end. And so I, I voted, I voted no. Um, but that being said, if someone could really show me, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I voted because I was like, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. And I know that there's going to be people who are going to say, if you look at dental rates and children, you know, we can't afford not to. Um, I did seriously consider abstaining. I actually got up from the booth and had left it. And then I, would you vote? You never talk about how you vote. How'd you vote? I voted yes. There's two two things I will tell anyone who asked me how I voted: the Senate elections and the referendum questions. I absolutely think that the Senate should have had a pineapple option. Also, oh, yeah, there's I, all these people and a pineapple. I only voted or a ficus person. plan. I only voted for one person on the Senate. Again, I don't think it matters. No, it doesn't. Justin Trudeau is going to appoint Iverson and Nenshi to on like in like a week's time. So I don't think so. Yeah, I, don't. I don't think so. Or they're going to get like trade representative to freaking like Zimbabwe. I think I think Nenshi will be an ambassador. I think they're sending him away. He will be an ambassador. Ambassador to Fire Island. (laughs) My God. And on that note, thanks for having me on, Chris. Yeah, thank you. It's been an hour and a half of fun conversations, which you just looked at the clock and you went, an hour and a half? What? I have work to do on this Friday morning. So thank you so much for doing this, Jen. Uh, For everyone, this has been a special edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, we are taking a few days off and that Saturday and Sunday, we are back with a week long series of shows next week, but we have two live episodes next week as well. One federal cabinet swearing in on Tuesday morning. Maybe Jen will be with us. If not, she might not be, uh, depending on her schedule, but I will be here at nine o'clock mountain standard time or, or probably a little bit early, but I think it's seven o'clock when it starts here. And we'll be talking about the federal cabinet and the direction that Justin Trudeau is going to be going in. So with that, Thank you so much for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent rest of the day. And if you want to support the show, please consider backing us via Patreon or internet interact e-transfer and all those fun shows. Thank you so much, Jen, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris.